There's the green light. Well, thank you all for inviting me to come and speak this morning. I greatly appreciate the elders uh, inviting me to come. My name is Seth McDonald. I am Kyle's older brother, and uh, so glad that uh, he's here, part of this group. Um, been here several times in the past, always a blessing just to hear this many people singing together and uh, the love that we feel when we come every time. Greatly appreciate you. Um, I am the full-time preacher for the Cape County Church of Christ, who used to be in Cape Girardeau, Missouri, in the city. We're still in Cape Girardeau County, but here very, very recently uh, that that changed. We're now in Jackson, Missouri, and I'll show you that in just a moment. Uh, this is a picture of my family. They're sitting here on the front. My wife, Megan, my two sons, Levi and Judah. This was uh, just a couple months ago when we went and visited the, the Ark in Kentucky. Uh, last night, we were able to get together with my parents and then their four kids, their spouses, and all of their grandkids. So I'm sure you recognize some of those faces, all of Kyle's kids that are in there. As well, so it was a great blessing to be able to come and, and be with my family last night. Worship here this morning. I'll be preaching this evening at Samaria uh, Church of Christ in Cookville, that also supports me. And then again on Wednesday night in Columbia before going and being with Megan's family on Thursday. So it's just a, a great opportunity for us. Um, Cape Girardeau is only three and a half. Uh, three hour, 15 minute drive from this building and uh, Contour Airlines, by the way, if anybody wants, it's just a $49. It, the wheel to wheel takes 20 minutes to fly to Cape Girardeau. We'd love to have you come up and, and see us. Uh, we are uh, in Cape Girardeau, which is like the 19th largest city in the state of Missouri, but it's a, a small, big town. We have two hospitals, Sam's Club, Target. Like, we got all of the stuff, but just nothing in any direction for at least half an hour. The closest congregations to us, there's a, a congregation in Van Duzer that's about 35 minutes away, and I'm actually going on every Sunday night and teaching Bible class there. The preacher there just recently fell and broke his hip, and he's going to be out of commission for like four months. So I'll be going uh, there every Sunday evening So for I don't know how long. Um, and then there's another congregation in New Madrid. It looks like it should be pronounced New Madrid, but it's Missouri, so they call it New Madrid. And then uh, there's also a church in Benton about an hour and a half away, and then Mayfield, Kentucky, and then St. Louis. But there's really nothing else around us. And uh, this is where we were worshiping for the past three years. It was a very nice building. It was very old. Uh, this was a, a picture taken during our gospel meeting, had a pretty full crowd. We did not own that building, and that building, we were told... Uh, we were told well ahead of that it might happen, but the lady who owned the church building sold it out from under us to the nursing home across the street. Uh, so we told a, a realtor friend, hey, be on the lookout for a building that we could rent or purchase. It would work as a church building, just something that would seat, you know, 40 to 100 people. And, uh, and we told her our price range, and she just laughed and said, those don't exist. There might be 30 of those in the whole county, and they never come up for sale. She called us the next day and said, you're not going to believe this. But uh, this building came up for sale the next day, and it was completely move-in ready with pews and everything. And we bought it for like $150,000, which was stellar. It was wonderful. It is in Jackson, Missouri, right off of the main highway in the same county. Um, so there's there's my view. It sits about 100 people or so, and it's just absolutely a humongous blessing. That's That happened like Wednesday was our first time in the new building. This morning is the first Sunday that, that we're in the new building, and I'm here instead. But uh, we're glad. So just really uh, excited about all the things that are happening in Cape Toronto. I have five studies going right now during the week. Uh, just lots of good, exciting times. It's one of the first places I've lived when you tell them, uh, when they say, what church do you preach for? And I say, the Cape County Church of Christ. And they go, Church of Christ, what's that? 
and it's three and a half hours away from here, or three hours, 15 minutes away, and you, don't, you just don't expect that. But evangelism opportunities are everywhere, and uh, it's been a great place to work. And uh, this year, uh, just like for everybody, expenses have gone up for everybody across the board, like 20%. And, uh, of course, that makes everybody sweat a little bit. But when the, the church here at Broadmoor said that they'd step up, and, and help with my support so I don't have to worry about financial responsibilities to take care of my family and I can just keep on working. Um, it very relieving and I'm very honored. Um, Paul said in Philippians, writing to people who had sent him financial assistance more than once, he said, I give thanks to my God for everywhere remembrance of you, always praying with joy for all of you in my every prayer, because of your partnership in the gospel from the last day till now. I consider you all partners uh, in the work in Cape Girardeau, Missouri, in, in that county. And um, I hope uh, I send out uh, progress reports every month, and uh, the elders receive those and distribute those how they see fit. So uh, please read those uh, if you are able and, and pray for the needs that we have in Cape Girardeau. I want to uh, tell you, uh, it was, I'm stealing from a lesson that I heard as a kid. You, I don't know if you've ever had one of those lessons that just stick with you forever. This lesson was preached by a preacher named uh, Jeff May in Fayetteville, Tennessee is where he was at the time. Now he's in Alabama. But he talked about four different guys who go to Bible class. We're, to, this morning we're going to call them Dan, Steve, Dave, and Frank. And if the, any of those names just happen to match anybody in here, pure coincidence. We're going to start by talking about Dan. See, Dan, we say he goes to Bible class, but really, Dan is the guy that comes in late for worship time, and then as soon as the amen happens, he's out the door. Dan, it doesn't seem like the word has ever really changed him in any way, and not many people of, of the church know Dan very well. He's never really changed his life. Church is just a thing that he does and that he goes to sometimes. But Steve here, Steve, he comes to Bible class. And, but, but honestly, it, you, he would never say this, but he doesn't like going to Bible class. He doesn't want to be there. And he'll find excuses to not go to Bible class. You know, I can't read in my Bible where churches had Bible classes in the New Testament, so it's not mandatory. Or they think they think of other people who don't come as justification for, for Steve not coming, and he creates reasons not to come, knowingly choosing a job that'll have him work every Wednesday night. Just, you know, I have to work. But, or Sunday is my only day to sleep in, and I had a hard week this week, and I just don't feel great, so I'll just go for worship. That's Steve. Dave, though, see, Dave is different from Steve. Dave, Dave would never make Steve's excuses. He knows he needs to grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord, knows he needs to study, be taught, be equipped, just like the scriptures teach. And Dave is at every Bible class and every service. He would never willingly forsake the assembly because he's been commanded not to forsake the assembly. But Dave's problem is that he's distracted. We're going to call him Distracted Dave. On Wednesdays, Dave hurries home from work, eats supper, searches for his Bible. He's not sure where he put it on Sunday night when he got home from church. So he's got to look around and find it and then finds his lesson book and you know maybe covers the first three questions. And when he's trying to fill out his questions, he looks at the question, looks where the blank is, and then looks at the text to try to find the secret word to fill in the blank. For his, or he'll come not prepared and count heads in front of him to see which question he's going to be responsible to answer, and then he'll just answer that one. But Dave, Dave would never miss a service, but the reason that he comes is from habit, not from hunger. He's not hungering for thirst, uh, hungering and thirsting for righteousness. You know, it would hurt his conscience to miss, but. Dave doesn't give attention to reading at home. He doesn't meditate on the word, but yet he never seems to grow. And he doesn't understand why that 
weeks go by, months go by, years go by, and Dave just feels stuck in the same place spiritually. He just never seems to grow. Dave has a form of godliness, but doesn't know the power that it has. Where Frank, Frank is faithful. Faithful, faithful Frank. He loves God, wants to know Jesus more than anything. He prays before studying his Bible. And he really wants to know what it says. He doesn't see the scriptures as dead works on a page, but life-giving. It's his nourishment. You know, Dave, Dave would look at Frank and Dave would say, man, I'd give the world to know the Bible like Frank does. You know what Dave doesn't know? That's exactly what Frank did. Frank gave up the world. Distracted Dave. That's what we're going to be talking about some in in this lesson this morning. We're going to be talking about the parable of the sower. And there are four different types of ground that Jesus is talking about. Before we really get into the meaning of the parable, we don't need to skip to that. The three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all give accounts of the parable of the sower. And each one of them has this middle chunk between where Jesus gives the story and then then when Jesus says what the story means. This middle chunk is the purpose of parables. And and if you have an outline and if you're filling that in, anytime there's an underline on, on the screen, that is your cue that that is a blank on your page. If I didn't mess that up, I've done that before. But this, we're going to talk about first the purpose of parables. And I, what I want to do now is actually read this parable. And uh, if you have a sheet, look on the back side. Matthew chapter 13, verses 1 through 23. And I want to do an exercise. If you have an ink pen with you, I want you to notice one word or a word that's like it. Notice the word hearing or listening or ear, anything to do with hearing or being observant. I want you to circle that word and notice how many times it pops up while we're reading through this text. Matthew 13, starting in verse 1. It says, On that day Jesus went out of the house and was sitting by the sea. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat down. While the whole crowd stood on the shore, then he told them many things in parables, saying, Consider the sower who went out to sow. As he sowed, some seed fell along the path. The birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where it didn't have much soil, and it grew up quickly since the soil wasn't deep. When the sun came up, it it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns came up and choked it. Still other seed fell on good ground and produced fruit, some a hundred, some sixty, some thirty times what was sown. Let anyone who has ears listen. Then the disciples came up and asked him, Why are you speaking to them in parables? He said, Because the secret of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you to know, but it has not been given to them. For whoever has, more will be given to him. He will have more than enough, but whoever does not have even what he has will be taken away from him. This is why I speak to them in parables, because looking they do not see, hearing they do not listen or understand. Isaiah's prophecy is fulfilled in them, which says, You will listen and listen, but never understand. You will look and look, but never perceive. Do these people's hearts have grown callous? Their ears are hard of hearing. They have shut their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn back, and I would heal them. Blessed are your eyes because they do see, and your ears because they do hear. For truly I tell you, many prophets and righteous people have longed to see the things you see, but they don't see them. To hear the things you hear, but didn't hear them. So, listen to the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word about the kingdom and doesn't understand it, the one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is the one sown along the path. The one sown on rocky ground, this is one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, but he has no root and is short-lived. 
When distress or persecution comes because of the word, immediately he falls away. Now the one sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the worries of the sage and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. The one sown on the good ground, this is one who hears and understands the word who produces fruit and yields. Some a hundred, some sixty, some thirty times what was sown. What do you notice about that? What is this whole parable about? It's about listening. Who have their listening ears on? Who are the people who are wanting to understand? When he says this is the purple purpose of, of parables, do you know, you know, preachers love to give illustrations like you know, maybe four guys on a screen and they tell you about it and then they give you an application about what it says. Jesus doesn't do that. What he says is, here's a story about a guy spreading some seed. And then he doesn't tell them the answer. He just says, if you have ears, listen. And then he just stops. He doesn't, he doesn't give the application. And then in private, the disciples say, why do you talk to them in, in parables and riddles? What Jesus is doing is giving a message that is, that is veiled. The, the, the crowd doesn't get it. Have you ever been scrolling on, on social media, on Facebook, and you come across an article that's just way above your head? Or the meme is just really confusing, and you just pass by it, and you're like, well, I, don't, I ain't got time for that, and you just keep scrolling? This is what the crowd is doing with Jesus. He says something weird and they go, well, that's weird. And they just walk away. But it's the disciples that are willing to ask the questions, to dig deeper. See, the sower is spreading seed on four types of grounds and has various results. And he finishes, let anyone who has ears listen. Uh, but when he explains the purpose, Matt, in Mark's version, Mark chapter 4, verse 13 Mark, Mark says, if you don't understand this parable, how are you going to understand any of them? This is the parable about listening. This is the parable about hearing. And if you're not hearing this one, you're not going to be able to understand any of them. So this one is important. And, and then he quotes from Isaiah chapter 6, verses 8 through 10, which you go back and read Isaiah and you wonder, this is, this is kind of a weird thing that God tells Isaiah to do. In Isaiah chapter 6, verses 8, the, first five chapters, Judah is going to be destroyed because of sin. And here Judah, uh, um, God is calling Isaiah. Isaiah said, I heard the loud voice, uh, the, the voice of the Lord asking, who should I send? Who will go for us? I said, here I am, send me. And he replied, go, say to these people. All right, the, could you imagine a preacher getting up and saying this? All right. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Here's the message that I have from God. Keep listening, but don't understand. Keep looking, but do not perceive. Make the minds of these people dull, deafen their ears, blind their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn back and be healed. That seems strange to you. It's like G that God is telling Isaiah, go tell them to not understand. Don't repent. Make your mind dull so that you can't be healed. You think that God's, that's what God actually wants? Absolutely not. It's not God's desire, but it is the inevitable outcome of this. The people aren't going to listen to what Isaiah have to say. And is it any different Today, when you go out and tell people, what percentage of the people will even give you the time of day to listen to a message about Jesus, about salvation? Their hearts are, and minds are dull, just like Isaiah's audience. So when Jesus here says, here's the parable, and then they ask him, "What's the? why are you talking to them like that? He's like, well, I, here's how I would put it. The purpose of parables are not for making the teaching easier to understand, but more profound for the people who are willing to dig. You look back in verse 11, 
What 11 said when the disciples come in and ask him and say, why are you speak to them in parables? He said, because the secrets of the kingdom of heaven have been given for you to know, but it has not been given to them. Who is he talking to there? I would argue that verse 11 is not just for the apostles. I would argue it's for anyone who's willing to ask, anybody who's willing to dig, anyone who isn't just scrolling past and go, well, that's weird. Like when Jesus said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you're not going to have life in you. And you know what happened? Most of the crowd went, that's gross and weird. And they left. But who stayed? The apostles. I said, are you going to leave too? Well, where would we go? You're the ones with words of eternal life. They were willing to dig. They were willing to, to, to search for what is truth. And that is what parables are about, is that they become profound. You can think about this parable alone for hours and hours and hours and just keep getting more richness out of it. But if you stay just on the surface level, it doesn't make any much sense, even if you do get the explanation. So let's talk about these first guys, this first guy, the dismissive heart. You know, we can call him dismissive Dan if you want, but the dismissive heart, this, this guy that the, the soil was, the seed was spread on, on path soil where people have walked over and over and over again. It's like concrete. Imagine spreading seed on, out on concrete. What's it going to do? It, it can't penetrate the soil. It's not that these hearts are incapable of understanding. It's just that the word is never considered. The, and uh, Mark's version of this, in Mark 14, verse 15, it says, The evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. That Mark says, and it's an immediate thing that happens. That even the seed that was sown there, and you think, well, eventually it might do some good. Mark says immediately Satan comes and just takes it away. If you have this dismissive heart where it's never going to penetrate, you're just not going to listen to it, it it's, even what you have will be taken away. There's nothing wrong with the seed or with the sower. If, if, if in the analogy, God is the sower and the seed is the word of God, and there's someone who has a hard heart, is it God's fault? Or is it the seed's fault that this person isn't listening? The answer is absolutely not. It's, it's with the, the soil itself. So it can be really easy to, to look at the parable of the sower and say, well, obviously I'm not guy number one or guy number two. Maybe fall into guy number three sometimes, but guy number four, pat on myself on the back and, and just leave. But I would argue that we can be the same dismissive guy. If I'm not hungering and thirsting for righteousness, if I come to a difficult passage like Revelation or Romans and you go, Man, I just don't understand that. And you just brush it off and say, I'll just stick with the easy stuff. If you're dismissing part of God's word, I mean, what, what type of a path are you, are you having if it's not penetrating you at all? Do I come together, do I even care about coming together with other Christians? Like dismissive Dan, who comes late for worship, never comes at all to Bible class, obviously not craving the word of God, just dismisses it outright. Second, the second type of soil is that rocky soil. We're going to call this superficial. Superficial Steve. He stays very surface level. What happens with this superficial heart? We'll read it again. The one sown on rocky ground. This is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. But he has no root and is short-lived. When distress or persecution comes because of the word, immediately he falls away. In this, it says that he received the word with joy and gladness. This is describing a baptized believer, 
Someone who readily accepts the salvation that Jesus offers, sees value in it, and, and jumps on that opportunity. You know, in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 and 20, we're told to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. But that's just part one of the Great Commission. Part two of the Great Commission is to teach them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. That the command is to go and baptize them, but also to firmly ground them in the, the doctrine that God wants them to know, to have a life-changing experience. But, but the superficial heart just stays on the surface level. Psalm 1 and 2 talks about the, the happy man or the blessed man. His delight is in the law of, uh, in the Lord's instruction, and he meditates on it day and night. He's like a tree planted beside flowing streams that bear fruits in its seasons, and its leaf does not wither. Whatever he does, he prospers. You, you think about how Jesus talks about this uh, rocky soil. As soon as the, the heat of day comes, persecution comes, just withers away. Psalm 1 depicts a tree planted by a stream of water with deep roots, can have access to that nourishing water that even when drought comes, He's still going to be solid. He's still going to be firmly planted. That, that is what we need to be, the one who delights in God's instruction and meditates on it day and night. The, the, uh, notice that there is a promise here as well, that distress and persecution is going to happen. Matthew chapter 10, just... Uh, a few chapters before this, Jesus said, you will be hated by everyone because of my name, by the one who endures to the end will be saved. You will face these difficult times. If I had to ask you, do you know for certain that there's going to be something ahead of you that is going to try to test your faith? How many people would raise their hand? Everybody. We know that a challenge is coming. So how do you know how you're going to handle that? Well, you have to be prepared now for it. But superficial, the superficial heart, superficial Steve, you know, he may come to Bible class some, but doesn't want to be there. He doesn't see it as important. He never firmly plants himself. And when that trying time persecution comes, Jesus said that he'll burn out. And he'll go away. The, the third type of soil that we have is the thorny soil. This is the distracted soil, distracted heart. Remember distracted Dave? The guy who's so busy with life that he can't remember where he put his Bible on Sunday when it's time to go to Bible class on Wednesday. The guy who never really prepares for his Bible class and doesn't know why he's not growing. Here, Jesus describes this man this way. Now, the one sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the worries of this age and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. The, the power of the word is nullified because of worries, riches, and Luke adds in the pleasures of life. Luke says, as for the seed that fell among the thorns, they're the ones who, when they have heard, go their way, are choked with worries, riches, and pleasures of life, and produce no mature fruit. The, the, notice that this guy isn't fallen away. He's not living a life full of sin. He's enjoying the good things that God has given them. Maybe he is, or, or he's worried about this world, deceived by riches, but... It's not that he's fallen away or full of sin. He's just empty. It's like Dave. He has a form of godliness. He's got a taste of it, but doesn't trust it. He doesn't know the full power. They hold a form of godliness, but deny its power. So when, when you think of, of this thorny soil guy, man, I see myself a lot in this, where I can very easily get distracted. I want to be entertained at all times. I, 
Uh, I'm just a guy who always has to be doing something with my hands, always have to be busy. I have to have an earbud in listening to an audio book when I'm doing anything. I just always have to have input. But that can be a snare. You can get distracted where it becomes too much and you just don't see yourself growing. If you don't see the gospel working in your life, the word is crowded out. Your life is too busy. This last type of soil, the thorny soil. I thought, oh, I did change it on some of these. Should say the fruitful heart. There we go. The fruitful heart. Fruitful, fruitful Frank. Uh, he in, understands, hears, understands, and produces. I love Isaiah chapter 50. This is one of those suffering servant passages where Isaiah is speaking, but he's almost speaking as Jesus. So when you read Isaiah here, put it in Jesus's voice. It says, the Lord God has given me the tongue of those who are instructed to know how to sustain a weary word, weary with a word. He awakens me each morning. He awakens my ear to listen like those being instructed. The Lord God has opened my ear. I was not rebellious. I did not turn back. I gave my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who tore my beard. I did not hide my face from scorn and spitting. The Lord God will help me. Therefore, I have not been humiliated. Therefore, I have set my face like flint, and I know I will not be put to shame. Jesus was flint-faced. He was stubborn, hard, hard-headed to be the righteous man that God wanted him to be. That God gave him the tongue of a disciple. He listened to the Father. He is the, the perfect example of the good soil. James 1 verse 22 through 25 talks about hearers. Be doers of the word and not hearers only. Deceiving yourselves. Because if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like someone looking at his own face in a mirror. For he looks at himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of person he was. The one who looks intently into the perfect law of freedom and perseveres in it. He is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer who works. This person will be blessed in what he does. Don't be just a hearer, but a hearer that is transformed by the word that, you're, that, that you are, are listening to. <clears throat> Did you notice the, the, the fruit that was produced from this? A hundred times what was sown, some 60 times what was sown, some 30 times what was sown. That tells me a couple of different things. First, if you put a seed in the ground and you give it all the right scenario that it's a good soil with all the right the, the environment for a seed to grow, what's going to happen to that seed? It, well, it's going to grow. It's a natural thing. If the word of God is implanted in your heart and you are that good type of soil who's listening and wanting to do and wanting to please the Lord, you will grow. There's no other option. The seed will grow. Do you notice that there are different levels? Sometimes it's 100, sometimes it's 60, and sometimes it's 30. Just because your growth level is different or is at a different rate than someone else doesn't mean that you're more faithful or less faithful than they are. God is pleased with your growth if you are that good heart. Even if you're a 30, and you might try to compare yourself to the 100 guy, but God is pleased if your growth is 30 level, whatever it might be. And like, you imagine a brand new Christian, when they first come up out of the water, you expect them to know everything and be perfect right off the bat? Well, of course not. What, is their, what are they going to be producing as far as fruit? Should be different than someone who's been a Christian for five years or 10 years or 20 years. God wants our heart, and our heart should be growing and becoming more like Jesus. God is pleased with differing level production as long as you have that good heart. But you know, if you don't see fruit, it is impossible for you to be that good soil. 
John 15, verse 5, Jesus uses a different analogy. He says, I am the vine and you are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him produces much fruit. That is an inevitable outcome. If you're remaining in Jesus and he's in you, you will be producing fruit because you can do nothing without me. But you know what happens to the vines that don't produce fruit? The branches that don't produce fruit, they get cut off. So what we need to do is to pray for an honest and good heart and hold on to the word and endure. Luke chapter 8 verse 15 is the same parable of the sower. And this is how Luke ends that parable. It says, the seed on the ground, these are the ones who having heard the word with an honest and good heart, hold on to it by enduring. Those are the people that produce fruit. How do you do that? How do you, how do you, can you effort your way? We need the Lord's help. Pray, ask for an honest and good heart. There are a lot of Psalms. Think of um, the ending of Psalm 19. May the words of my mouth, meditations of my heart, always be pleasing to you, my Lord, my rock, and my redeemer. That to Asking God to search my heart and see if there's any evil way in me. I want to be good soil. Get those rocks out of here. Get, I want to have the heart that is receptive to the word of God. And you need his help. So pray for that. This is the, the parable of the sower. It seems simple. The more you think about it, the more profound it is. I don't know what type of heart that you've had here recently. If you've been more just superficial, just sitting on the surface, you come every time, but it's never really taken hold of you at all. Or if you're dismissive, you're just here because mom drags me here. Or if you're here, but you've been distracted by the cares of this world, pleasures of this life, deceitfulness of riches, and you just haven't been productive. That there's been no growth in you for the last weeks, months, or years. You just haven't seen any change spiritually. I would, I would urge you to pray to God and ask for help with that. If you need other people to pray with you and pray for you, I know the elders here and every other member in here would love that opportunity to help you to produce fruit, to be that good heart, to cultivate into the type of Christian that you would want to be. You remember Distracted Dave would say, I would love to have the Bible knowledge that Faithful Frank has. Are you willing to give up the world? If you've never become a Christian, if you've never been baptized into Christ, accepted him and, and, and put him on the, as king of your heart, we urge you to do that this morning. We have water available. We could baptize you into Jesus. If there's a way that we can help you be pleasing to the Lord, we ask you to come to the front as we stand and sing.